Hey, hello, hi, everybody. Hi, welcome to weekly live Q&A here at Trauma Recovery University. This is where the global community of adult survivors of trauma, complex trauma, come every single week. We do live Q&A and um, you have um, questions and we usually have a topic every single week and lately we've been doing a series on healing our CPTSD symptoms and we're talking a lot about core belief restructuring and how we can move towards changing our behaviors, changing our daily habits. So um, this is a live interactive broadcast so if you're watching on a replay you are so welcome here and I'm super glad that you're here. Welcome, welcome. And if you're here for the live conversation which is every single Monday in the United States, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday morning, 2 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time in the UK. And if you're in Australia, we have a growing audience in Australia, and it's Tuesday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, wherever you are in the world, um, I checked our analytics, and we're up to 189 countries that we're actually reaching, either live or on a replay. Um, which is pretty amazing for just a little YouTube channel. We have a Roku TV channel also. You can go to Roku.com or RokuTV.com and search for Trauma Recovery University as well. But um, it's just very humbling, and I'm super grateful to be here with you guys. My name is Athena, and I've been coming here every week for a over three years now and just hanging out with all of you guys and just leading the discussion basically. The transformation and the healing happens in the discussion, in the questions that you guys send me and that you guys ask. So really quickly, next week we're going to be starting a new series. Um, let me, I want to read the exact proper title <laughs> of next week's um, new series. So that you guys can get prepared and maybe like do some Google search searches. Um, so next week we're starting a series on our trauma narrative, a healthy narrative um, versus a trauma narrative. So in in living with symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder and um, healing from complex trauma, we have a narrative in our life. It's, it's the story in which we sort of tell our life or the story in which we identify our life with. And so if you're, like if we're talking about like for a child, um, and remember we're talking about a trauma narrative versus a healthy narrative and so it goes right along with core belief restructuring and moving towards behavior change moving towards cha towards changing our daily habits and so a trauma narrative or just a narrative in general just to prepare you guys for next week and then we'll dive right into tonight's topic which is uh, healing CPTSD through core belief restructuring and then moving towards behavior change as well. So they're all very connected. So just really quickly, a narrative would be like, um, let's say when you're a child and you get in trouble, the story you tell yourself is, and then I got in trouble because I'm bad and I do wrong things and I, I'm, I'm not smart and the, the story, we, the narrative, the narrative that we tell ourselves, the, the way that a child understands what it is that's going on. And so a healthy narrative or repairing that old narrative, what that would look like is we would look at, well, these are things that happened. These are the things that happened. And the reason that I spoke to you that way or the reason I got in trouble for these things is because if I didn't stop what I was doing, then this bad thing would have happened. But I'm not bad. It's I was doing something and it wasn't the healthiest choice. And so we're going to dive into that really, 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 really deep. Um, 
there are three videos on Katie Morton's channel talking about this as well. I forget the titles. I should have found those so that I could link those up. But um, that's what we're going to be talking about next week. But tonight we're going to be wrapping up the series, the three-part series that we've been doing on healing our CPTSD, our complex post-traumatic stress symptoms, um, our complex post-traumatic stress injury, and how that relates to our daily habits and the core beliefs that we hold about ourselves. So there are some questions from last week and then a couple from the week before as well that were not answered um, because this was just such a big, big topic and you guys were so excited about it. So let me just, um, let's see. Well, thank you to John Harvey for sending in a question tonight. And then last week, I want to thank John, Elizabeth, Lulu, Rach, Monica, Ashton, and then I can't remember. I believe I are. I, I finished all the ones from the week before. So tonight's questions are going to be from Ashton, Monica, Rach, Lulu, Elizabeth, and John Harvey so far. But if you guys have questions and you're here for the live discussion, by the way, like you, I get emails and messages from you guys all the time. How can I support this work you're doing, Athena? I'm so, 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 so grateful. Um, how can I help? What can I do? Um, you have volunteers. Um, what what can I do? How can I how can I help? And I I just want to let you know that anytime you guys share the content that I make, anytime you share the videos that I record, when you give these videos a thumbs up, when you subscribe to the channel, when you click the little bell so that you get notifications when I go live, when you when you share the the content, that is the hugest help. It really is because you're telling the people at Google who own YouTube that the content I'm putting out is relative or it's relevant and it's informative, relevant and informative, not relative. <laughs> it's relevant, it's informative, and it's, um, and it's helpful for you, the consumer, the end consumer, the person that is here logging on to YouTube. So, um, the live chat feature on YouTube, the chat box, is something that um, YouTube was playing around with for quite some time, and they're they're finally sticking with it, and they're tweaking it, and they're perfecting it, and it's really really exciting because it makes the experience, the user experience for for live videos, so much more enjoyable. So if you're here for the live discussion, it would mean a lot to me if you would give this video a thumbs up. If you would subscribe to my channel, if you would click the little bell, and if you deem this video share worthy, it would mean a lot to me if you shared the video. So that is how you can help me in the work that I'm doing, and I'd like to just make the rest of this whole entire night all about you guys and your questions. So um, thanks to everyone who's been sending in questions. Thank you to all of you guys who are sending in emails. Um, I receive every one of your emails and I don't always get an opportunity to respond to every single one of them. Um, and I, I do get your, your DMs for the most part and your messenger messages as long as we're friends. Otherwise it goes into some other weird folder that I don't know where it is. Um, but I just want to say thank you for um, your interactiveness, your part. You guys are here doing your part. You guys are participating. You're doing what is necessary to heal. Your, your trauma recovery journey is important, and that's why I show up here and I make these videos. Whether you're an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse, narcissistic abuse, human trafficking, cult abuse, religious abuse, emotional abuse, verbal, physical, you name it. Whatever type of abuse you're, you're a survivor of, you're brave, and it takes a lot of courage to even be here on this channel watching these videos. So if you've made it this far, congratulations. And again, thanks for your thumbs up and for your subscribing and for your sharing, if you're sharing the content. Um, I did start a new YouTube channel 
um, for daily content, it's going to be a little bit more bite sized, like smaller, you know, shorter videos. Um, and I'm super excited. I already have like over 50, I think I have 50 subscribers on the new YouTube channel. Um, and I think I linked it. I linked it up. Um, I left a whole bunch of messages for you guys in the chat box. And when I got here today to start, they were all gone. So I think maybe if you guys all showed up early and you didn't get any messages from me, will you let me know? Because if that's the case, I won't post the messages earlier on, like two hours early. Um, they just disappeared. They were completely gone. So um, I know that John Harvey was here. I think Ashton was here. I'm trying to think who else was here early when I came over and said hello to you guys like 15 minutes before um, before broadcast time. Um, I had like 10 messages that I typed out for you guys beforehand. Can one of you or all of you let me know, yes, I got your messages, they weren't deleted, or what are you talking about, Athena? There were no messages because they were put too many hours early, so I won't do that anymore. So um, just let me know. Um, I will uh, mostly be staying on topic tonight and uh, just so we can get through everyone's questions. So if you send in questions that are not on topic, then if I have time at the end, I'll answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to stay on topic tonight. And really quickly, I'm going to do a refresher of the screen share that we've been talking about so that uh, we are up to date on what topic how we're approaching this topic and if you're new here please read the description section of this video so that you know um, where we're coming from when we're talking about these topics trigger warning if you have survived any type of trauma um, any type of child abuse any type of maltreatment the chat box is never a place for crisis support ever 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 YouTube is not a place for crisis support I am NOT crisis care and the people that are here in the chat box are here because they want to um, they want to heal and they want to have a safe environment so if you're triggered then you'll need to step away and go get the care you need and not spin out and trigger everybody in the chat box that's not going to be allowed I'll just have somebody block you not because I don't care about you and it's not okay that you're triggered it's that if you're triggered you need to go get proper care and if you're gonna stay here and you're gonna be engaged in the broadcast then you're gonna either just be lurking and be in a place where you can just receive support or you're gonna be active having a conversation and and then you're not triggered but um, this is not a place for bullies this is not a place for anybody to be picking on anybody else or putting anybody else down that won't be tolerated you'll be blocked you'll be banned you'll be kicked out um, this is a place for kindness this is a place for support and this is a place where everybody can learn and feel safe so if you're not in a place where you're able to cultivate and maintain a safe environment then you need to leave and just come back and watch a replay we don't love you any less it's just really important to me that everyone has a safe environment while they're here so with that being said I'm gonna go ahead and briefly do a screen share so that you guys can be up to date on the topic and then we will dive right into your guys's questions um, hopefully you can see this okay um, let me know uh, Matt or anyone if you guys can see this okay so we're talking again um, just a repeat this is part three we're wrapping up a series on healing complex post-traumatic stress disorder we're talking about core belief restructuring and behavior change also known as changing our daily habits a trauma-informed approach is key absolutely this is one of the most important things right here you guys making sure that the care you're receiving is trauma-informed meaning that we're not just treating you like a list of symptoms and just helping you with your symptoms only and we're not only treating the original trauma from a long time ago the two coexist with one another and they overlap and oftentimes the trauma we incurred from a very long time ago has affected our lives in many different ways and has caused our present-day reality to be much different than it would have had the trauma not 
happen in the in the first place. So we keep both of them in mind when we are looking at a comprehensive approach to recovery from any type of trauma. So first bullet point, we're going to identify the past abuse and complex trauma. And that's different for everyone. Not everyone's abuse was sexual. Not everybody's abuse was physical, emotional, financial, cult abuse. Uh, not everyone has been trafficked. Not, any, not everyone has um, lived in a neglectful situation or an overtly abusive situation or a, a covertly narcissistic situation. Everyone's abuse is different. Everyone's complex trauma um, is, is likely going to be similar. We'll be able to relate with one another's stories, but they're not going to ever be identical. And if we want to fully heal and we're ready to fully heal and we're in that place where behavior change is something we can devote some of our time to, changing our daily habits and really looking at our core beliefs, then we're going to need to choose to accept the reality of our abuse, which is oftentimes the most painful because... There's a grieving process, you guys. There's a deep, deep, deep grieving process that goes along with choosing to accept the reality of the abuse we incurred. The grieving process is similar to that of someone who has lost a loved one, to, uh, to someone who has possibly lost a limb, lost one of their extremities, uh, their life as they know it is no longer the same. They can't just hop up out of bed and go for a run because perhaps they've they've they're an amputee. They've been ampu amputated below the knee on let's say their left leg. They can no longer uh, let's say they're uh, we we have had our right arm amputated or our left hand amputated. We can no longer hop up out of bed on autopilot and just go make the coffee or go. Uh, jump in the car and go to work. Our, our lives are different. So when I say choose to accept the reality of it all, that is so simple when you say it like that. Choose to accept the reality of it all. And when we say all, we mean all of the abuse that happened. And that is not as simple as it sounds, you guys. It is complex. It is most definitely complex because there is a deep grieving process that goes on. And as though you are an amputee, your life is different. It is not the same as it would have been had your sexual abuse, narcissistic abuse, physical, emotional, verbal, whatever type of abuse you endured, your life is now different. You approach it differently. The autopilot that you used to be on or that you can imagine being on is different because of the trauma. And so when we choose to accept the reality of it all, it means that we're willing to, to integrate a, a grieving process into the life that we're now living. It means that we're going to take some time and some emotional energy, oftentimes a lot of time and a lot of emotional energy towards accepting that reality and grieving. And what did, what are we grieving? What are we grieving? Well, Athena, nobody died. Um, well, Athena, I'm not an amputee. I have all of my limbs. Or, or um, the conversation that you're having in your mind right now that is possibly resisting choosing to accept the reality of your abuse. So we could be grieving our innocence. We could be going through the grieving process as it pertains to the close relationship that we always dreamed of with our mother or with our father or with our brother or our sister or our grandma or our grandpa or our auntie or our uncle. We are grieving the closeness that we always wanted with uh, our family of origin. We're grieving the loss of the fantasy that was the beautiful relationship of having a, um, our, our mother or our father be our best friend and our mentor and the person that we could lean on um, in good times and in bad who always had our back. We're grieving the loss of perhaps having 
um, the relationship that we always wanted with our siblings, it's actually different because they were either one of our abusers or they were an enabler, someone who knew what was going on and did nothing. They were complicit. So if none of this describes you, then perhaps just turn off this particular video and then come back another time or go find um, something else that you feel like watching or listening to because that I just described exactly who this video is for. Um, there is there's a deep grieving that goes on and it's part of the core belief restructuring. It's part of the, the changing of our daily habits. It's part of existing in this new reality and it's quite, quite, quite painful and it's never ever going to be easy or one and done or um, super simple and why is it why is it not going to ever be super simple because we have endured complex trauma it happened over a long period of time it's not something simple that was just a one-time occurrence it was something we can't quite put our finger on it happened over years perhaps decades um, and we can't quite wrap our head around it. So as we move forward and we choose to accept the reality of it all and we intentionally choose to reframe the core beliefs which we're, we're holding on to that happen to be holding us back, what are some core beliefs that we're holding on to that could be that could be holding us back? What are some of these here? What are the core beliefs that we're holding on to? We don't even know we're doing it maybe and they're holding us back from being healthy and whole. They're holding us back from experiencing peace. They're holding us back from experiencing joy. They're holding us back from living the life that we know we've always wanted with healthy relationships that are deeply connected, where we feel safe in our own skin, comfortable in our own skin, safe in our environment. We don't have a, a sense of hypervigilance all the time. We're not feeling afraid all the time. We're not waiting for the other shoe to drop on any given day. What are these core beliefs that cause us to feel all of those things. Well, the core beliefs are they every single version of a faulty core belief boils down to one of three is what I have found. One of three buckets. Which bucket do you fall into? Is do you hold a core belief? And you can hold more than one, by the way. And if there are more, I would love for you to put them in the chat box. If none of these three resonate with you, these faulty core beliefs, and you can think of a different one then put it in the chat box and, and make sure uh, to tag Matt at Surviving My Past so that I can mention it here on the broadcast and help more people that are going to watch the replay. But these are the three core beliefs that are faulty, that are keeping us stuck. Okay, ready? Number one, the, one of the faulty core beliefs is I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. Faulty belief number two, I am unlovable. Faulty belief number three, I am bad. Also known as bad to the core, uh, made of bad things, evil, I am no good. And so those core beliefs, if any of them rung true for you, or you feel like you can identify with either I am unworthy, I am unlovable, or I am bad, then, then that is a faulty core belief. It's a shame-based living. You are living a shame-based life. It, it comes from a place of toxic shame, which never belonged to you. It was a lie, it was a core message that was never corrected when you were younger. You were either raised in an environment where someone through words or actions or withholding of love taught you that you were unworthy, unlovable, or bad. And those three things are lies and we don't know any better because as children, if we are in an environment that's unsafe, if we believe that we are unworthy and we are unlovable and we are bad, then guess what that means for us when we are a child and we're in an unsafe situation? Guess what that means? It means that we have some control. 
if we're the problem, we can change it. We can change the outcome if we are the problem. But guess what? If we didn't hold that core belief, which likely helped us to stay alive if we were in an unsafe situation, then we would have been forced to believe the truth, which was my environment is unsafe. And in a child's eyes, do you know what that means? It means that you're going to die. Because when you're a child, everything is life and death. The lights are on, it means that, that life is going on. When it's dark outside, you know, there's, there's nothing really going on. When you wake up, the whole world is alive. When you go to sleep, there's no such thing as a world. It's just black and white thinking. It's a child's magical thinking. So really sit with that and ask yourself and really challenge yourself to be super duper honest in your assessment of where am I? Which core belief do I hold that is, that is faulty, that's a lie? Is it that I am unworthy? I don't feel worthy. I'm not worthy of good things. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of kindness. I'm not worthy of making uh, a living that is, that is, uh, I'm making plenty of money. I am, I'm living in abundance. I'm not worthy of abundance. I'm not worthy of good things. I'm not worthy of, of reciprocity in my relationships. Or is your faulty core belief, I am unlovable. I'm not able to be loved. The reason that I don't have love in my life is because I am not lovable. I'm just not a lovable person. I'm prickly. I, my, my family of origin didn't ever really love me unconditionally. There were always conditions placed on my love. And so the reason that I don't have healthy relationships and why I feel so alone in the world and why I don't cultivate healthy and safe relationships is because I'm just an unlovable person. Faulty core belief, or is it the last one, which is I am bad. I'm just bad. I'm a bad person. I do bad things. I'm a bad person. If you really, really, really knew me, Athena, you would agree. I am just bad. I'm evil. I'm bad. I am no good. And... I will likely hurt other people if I am near them. If, if you really, really knew me, Athena, you would agree that I was bad. You would agree that I'm a bad person, Athena. So is it number one, number two, or number three? Which one is it? And I would love to hear from you if there are more. Those are usually the three buckets, you guys. It's surrounding worthiness, being unlovable, you're either, you're, either, you're either feeling unworthy, you're feeling unlovable, or you're feeling bad. And it's possible to be feeling all three. It's possible that all three were fed to you. All three lies were fed to you. And you could have been carrying those around for a really, really, really long time, and they keep us stuck. So we're going to move to the bullet point number two down here. And this is something that... Um, will turn on some light bulbs for you guys. You're going to have some light bulb moments. So we must all choose to look at our past trauma with fresh eyes, refusing to numb stuff and avoid our pain through maladaptive coping strategies. So this sounds like I'm being little Miss Bossy Pants, right? Athena says I must choose to look at my, my past trauma. Now, I want to be very, very clear. I'm not at all wanting to come at this from a little Miss Bossy Pants sort of posture and say, you must do this. Everybody's the same, cookie cutter, cookie cutter trauma recovery, one size fits all. No, but I am saying, what I am saying about bullet point number two is if you really want to break free from those faulty core beliefs of I am unworthy, I am unlovable, and I am bad, then we're going to need to choose, which doesn't happen on accident, right? Choices are things we make. They don't just happen. They don't fall in our laps. We have to, we have to change some things. We have to be intentional about choosing. We have to choose to look at our past trauma with fresh eyes. What does that even mean, fresh eyes? What it means is there are younger versions of you 
that are engulfed. They're overwhelmed. They're hypervigilant. They're afraid. There's there's a version of you that's even maybe even here right now with you right now that that is terrified of this video because those these the maladaptive coping strategies that have that have kept you alive from the time you were little those aren't things that, that we want to look at with fresh eyes there's a younger version of you that's terrified that you're going to stop numbing stuffing and avoiding because those little versions of you have done their very 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 best to help you and to keep you alive for years maybe even decades but when we take a step back <sighs> and we breathe deep and we check in with ourselves and we're fully present in our body in the present time. We look and we check in with our five senses. What are we seeing? What are we, what are we hearing? What are we feeling? What are we, what are we uh, sensing? What feelings do we have? And um, you know, if you take a drink of cold water, what are you tasting? You're, you're igniting all five of your senses. You're present in your body. You're grounded. And then we go, okay, I endured some past trauma. It was in the past, and I've been re-traumatized 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100, 200, 300, 500 times in my adult life through relationships and just re-traumatization, whether it's through family of origin or doctor's visits or my therapist wasn't trauma-informed and they shamed me or there are people at work and they're bullying me or I was on the subway and someone violated my personal space, someone broke into my apartment two weeks ago and they stole my items, my car got stolen, um, I broke I broke my leg two years ago. I lost use of my leg and I was handicapped and I was, I've been swirling ever since because it tapped into all this other trauma that I experienced. And so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to look at all of our past trauma with fresh eyes and we're going to see it for what it really is. And what we're talking about regarding our past trauma is the abuse that was perpetrated against us. Not what we did to deserve it, like other people say. But what, ex what actually happened? I was a child, and there was an adult or an older child or another child my age that took advantage of me, lured me in, and made me believe that they were being nice to me. And then they capitalized on that moment, and they took advantage of me, and they stole my innocence. They sexually abused me. They exploited me. They got me to do bad things. They tricked me into saying horrible things about someone, and then I got picked on. And Or they, they lied to me and told me that they needed something from me, and so I did some things that were really, really bad so that I could help them because I wanted them to like me. I needed them to like me. Or I was little and I don't remember hardly anything I just I have these memories Athena of someone I think they're I think my my youth pastor they were like 10 years older than me and there was sexual abuse or I was lured into going and um, I got an email just this past weekend um, someone's past trauma what happened to them is they were lured into going out on a date with someone a blind date and it ended up turning into a situation where they were lured into a trafficking situation. They showed up at somebody's house, they were actually drugged, and they ended up being held in captivity for over two years, and they were forced to have sex with all of these different people, and they were told that they, the first time they did it, it was on their own accord, and that if they tried to go back home, that their family would never believe them, and that they would never be looked at the same, and they would be um, shunned in their community so they might as well just live the lifestyle that they chose and then they what they do is they lure you in and then they get you to do something and then they shame you for doing what you did and then they isolate you and they keep you away from your family or your loved ones or even from yourself uh, because you're no longer yourself you're you you've been sort of hijacked your mind has been hijacked and so what happens when those horrible things happen to us in our past, our past trauma, whatever that past trauma was, what that does is it causes such psychological pain that our brain can't handle it. And so in order for us to handle the pain of the truth that is our life, we numb, we stuff, and we avoid. And those are things that have kept us alive for years, perhaps decades. 
we numb through busyness or over exercising or drugs or alcohol or um, sometimes there's a pornography addiction, a gambling addiction, a sex addiction, um, a spending habit, um, you name it. There's all kinds of different ways that we can numb. We, we stuff our feelings. We pretend it never happened. I don't know. Ain't nobody got no time for this. It is. Uh, no. There's no reason why I need to deal with this. No one's going to believe me. It, it was in the past. What's in the past is in the past. I need to move on. And so I'm just going to move on and I'm going to pretend it never happened. So we stuff, right? But then it springs up later on down the road. Or we avoid. And the way we avoid is by doing many different things. We avoid our feelings, we avoid our pain, we avoid our needs. We throw ourselves in a whole other direction, perhaps professionally, or we just avoid the old trauma. Because who wants to deal with that? And we do it through a lot of different ways. So if we numb and we stuff and we avoid, then we're not really choosing to look at our trauma with fresh eyes, right? And so if we don't look at our trauma with fresh eyes, then we are not choosing to accept the reality of the abuse, which means we're not ever gonna fully, fully, fully heal. Now you might not be in a place in your life right now where you're ready to accept the reality. You might need, in order to maintain what it, your life the way it is, you might need to numb stuff and avoid your pain through maladaptive coping strategies, okay? Maybe you really feel like you're gonna have a psychotic break or a traumatic break with reality if you process the pain. That is something only you can decide, only you. And I highly recommend reaching out and getting professional help from a therapist, a trauma-informed, a trauma-informed therapist, okay? And talk with them about how you're feeling. Tell them about your past trauma. Make sure they're trauma informed because otherwise they could they could really you know what's in the past is in the past. Are you sure it really happened? And then your pain is even sharper than it was previously, and then you repeat the pattern. So trauma informed approach is key. Find a practitioner that will understand and listen to you and help you with grounding and work you through a therapeutic process so that you can have healthy coping strategies, right? And the way we get healthy coping strategies is when we change our daily habits. And that's the whole goal so that we can have lives that are filled with more peace and joy and we're not filled with fear and hypervigilance. Bullet point number three, always remember that you are a whole person and not a list of symptoms. This really talks here about what I was talking about regarding trauma-informed care. A trauma-informed practitioner is going to see you as a whole person. They are going to see you for who you are now and for that little person that you were back when your trauma was happening. It's very, very, very important for you to be seen as a whole person because the goal is wholeness. The goal is wholeness. And what I mean by wholeness is uh, joy, peace, laughter, relationships that are deep and connected, a sense of belonging, a sense of feeling comfortable in our own skin. We really feel whole. We don't feel broken. So in order for you to feel whole, you're going to be need to see need to be seen as a whole person by a trauma-informed practitioner that can hold a safe space for you until you see that version of yourself that he or she already sees. Next bullet point. Always make it your goal to clearly address any and all chemical imbalances created by alcohol, drugs, and eating disorders. Now, here when we mention alcohol, drug, and eating disorders, that really is what's going on with the numbing, your pain, and those are really just maladaptive coping strategies, okay? Alcohol, drugs, and eating disorders, not only do they fall under the umbrella, under the, under the, uh, the term mental illness, 
alcohol addiction, drug addiction, and eating disorders, those are all mental illness. Those are things that have kept us alive. When we numb through alcohol or we numb through drugs or we control our food, then we don't think about our pain from our past trauma, right? It's a diversion. So we need to make sure to always make it your goal to clearly address those imbalances. They create a chemical imbalance in your, in your brain, you guys. Your body is not chemically balanced if you're adding alcohol, drugs, or if you're withholding calories, or if there's a binge eating disorder, or if there is binging and purging going on, or even um, over-exercising, okay? That's also a way to numb. It's also a maladaptive coping strategy. And up here, you guys, all maladaptive means, ooh, let me see if I can do the fancy thing. Look up maladaptive. All maladaptive means is that it's not providing adequate or appropriate adjustment to the environment or situation. So if you have a maladaptive coping strategy, it's not taking into consideration the present moment that you're living in and the best way to handle a situation. It's actually something that used to help keep you alive but it's no longer really helpful for you present day, okay? So we wanna always make sure to address chemical imbalances that can be caused by drugs, alcohol, and eating disorders. And why do I say that? Why? Because guess what? If you decide that you wanna wake up tomorrow and you're like, you know what, Athena's right, that lady on the YouTube, she's right. I need to just quit drugs and alcohol and I need to just change everything. I, I, she said that we need to work on behavior change. The lady on YouTube said that I need behavior change. That's what I'm going to do. Cold turkey. No drugs, no alcohol. Everything's going to be healthy. Guess what? You could die. It needs to be titrated, you guys. There needs the, the, the method that in which you heal, there needs to be, there needs to be balance. Okay, and you need to be under a doctor's care, a licensed professional, someone who can help you so that you're not just out there swimming in the ocean all alone trying to figure this whole trauma recovery thing out on your own. It's not going to happen that way, okay? And then last bullet point, always choose to combine experiential learning with cognitive learning. How? What is that, Athena? Well, in addition to traditional talk therapies like cognitive behavior therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, which are closely, closely related, one stems from the other, those are talk therapies. What you need to intentionally choose to do is releasing your past trauma, which we talked about, right? That's grieving. We're releasing it. And then you have unresolved pain as well, which we talked about earlier. But guess what? When you add in somatic or physical element to your trauma recovery, somatic experiencing, like deep body work or trauma sensitive yoga, something that's physical in nature, even going on walks, getting your heart rate up a little bit, this, if you do this separate from your talk therapy in addition to talk therapy, oh my goodness, it wor they work in tandem with one another. And you're your recovery and your experience of wellness is exponential. It's incredible. So some examples, like I mentioned a few moments ago, of somatic or physical, right? There's trauma-sensitive yoga, nutrition education, such as learning how to prepare whole organic delicious meals, detoxification, which we mentioned earlier regarding drugs and alcohol and eating disorders, acupuncture, deep body work, structural integration, cranial sacral, gentle group exercise, and fitness. And like we mentioned last week, you guys, there are free YouTube videos where you can do trauma-sensitive yoga in your living room or even some gentle exercises um, that, are, that are easy. card to a video titled uh, Discovering Movement. Um, my girlfriend Claudia is a trauma sensitive yoga. She's a yoga practitioner. She teaches other yoga instructors how to be more amazing yoga instructors. Anyway, she is in this video that Harriet is popping the YouTube card up on if you're watching a replay. And um, it's called Discovering Movement. And 
in the video, Claudia does the able-bodied versions, and then I am sitting on my sofa, and I am doing the limited mobility version of the different exercises. And there's a trigger warning on that video, you guys, obviously, um, especially if you've endured any type of childhood trauma. It can bring up old stuff for you. Anytime you add um, a somatic or physical element to your trauma recovery, you're going to bring up old stuff that perhaps you haven't thought about in years, maybe even decades. So again, just note, like I mentioned earlier, somatic and physical healing modalities are not a replacement for traditional talk therapies. They work in tandem with one another. And like I said last week and the week before you guys, CPTSD or complex trauma calls for a more complex healing approach, a multi-pronged healing approach, okay? So I'm hoping that that was helpful for you guys. Um, I'm just going to check in and, and see if you guys have sent in any more um, questions. And I'm going to get a drink of water. Oh, I dropped my napkin and my water's just getting everywhere now. Darn it. Um, I'm just going to check your guys' questions. One second. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yes, yes, yes. Lots and lots of questions. Lots, lots and lots of questions. Yay. Okay. Oh, I'm so excited you guys are loving this topic. I am so excited you're loving this topic. Yay. All right. So last week we ended on Shai Sharon's core belief, which is that she's so messed up, which would also fall under the category of I am bad, which is a lie. You're not bad. So tonight's first question is from Ashton, who bravely asked this question seven days and 53 minutes ago. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here again, Ashton. And I'm sorry it's taken so long. I'm glad we did a three-part series. Ashton's question is, having multiple abusers makes me feel somehow responsible for what happened to me as a child, especially the loss of my virginity and innocence. How can I change this core belief? Ooh, what an excellent first question, Ashton. You and I are in similar camps. I've had multiple abusers and my virginity was taken from me as well. And I struggled. I had similar core beliefs like I must have caused this. Like it's not like I can look at this one situation and go, "Oh, well, if this just happened this one time and that person is the one that's bad and and I can vilify the abuser, right? Because I can clearly picture them in my mind and it's super duper clear and it's concise and it's simple. But the complex nature of having multiple abusers causes us to feel unsafe in the world and so we turn it around on ourselves and we reason that we must be responsible because then it gives us some control. And then it's not unsafe and then we can actually control something and so therefore we don't have to die. That's our that's our younger version of our self inside reasoning, right? It's the pendulum swinging so far in one direction and then far, far, far in another direction. It's black and white thinking. So if there were multiple abusers, it must be my fault. Therefore, if it was my fault, I can change it. <laughs> so what has helped me, um, Ashton, is looking at here in my adult self, first I'm grounding myself, right? I see a photograph on the wall. I hear my air conditioner. I feel my feet on the carpet. I taste the water that I just took a drink of. I'm grounded, I'm in my body in the present and then I look back at that situation and I go well I was a child when I was first violated and so that younger version of me learned that in order to stay alive they had to do things and and say things and be certain things for certain people and they had to act a certain way 
and they had to comply. And sometimes that meant going places or thinking things or saying things or doing things that weren't necessarily what I would want to think or say or go and do. And since that was my norm, that's all I believed I was good for. So I had this malware planted in my hard drive from a very, very young age. And my whole operating system ran on this particular piece of malware. It didn't know any better. And so I know now that even though I had so many multiple abusers, some of them even in my adulthood, that I was subconsciously seeking out what was familiar. And yeah, that's very Freudian. It sounds very woo-woo. It sounds like psychobabble, but it's the truth. Our brains are complex. And if I learned a faulty belief and I saw the world through my trauma lenses, my whole world was colored with this particular belief, which was, this is what I do. This is what love is, or this is how I receive attention. This is how I receive love. This is how I get people to like me, or I don't want to say anything or upset the apple cart or make waves or rat anybody out because all you have is family, right? Or what are they going to think? They're, gonna, they're not going to believe me or they're going to say, well, why didn't you say something a long time ago? It's too late for me to say something. There are so many things that pop up, right? But if I'm here on October 9th, 2017, and I feel the carpet and I see the wall and I, and I smell lavender and I hear the air conditioner and I taste the water that I just drank, and I'm here, and I'm 43 years old, almost 44, I look back at that younger version of me, and then the slightly older version, and then the slightly older version, and then the slightly older version, and then the adult version even, and my heart breaks for that person that was me that didn't know any better, that was mistreated for years and decades and didn't know that there was a better way, and didn't know that there was a safe life filled with safe people. That version of me didn't know what a boundary was because my boundaries were violated from birth. That version of me didn't know what a safe person was because there was no such thing as a safe person. That version of me didn't know what a healthy choice was or a healthy habit was because I was never taught healthy choices or healthy habits on a regular basis. So I have compassion for that younger version of me and for all those versions of me and with that compassion comes a little bit of sadness and a little bit of grieving that happens and then I hold on to that self-compassion and I write about it in a journal I look at those core beliefs which were it was my fault. Why was it my fault? Because I'm unworthy of safety. I'm unlovable unless I fill in the blank. I am bad, which is why that's all I was good for, or whatever the core belief is. And then I would write about that. From a place of self-compassion, as my adult wise self, I would write to my younger self, or I would fill my heart and fill my current self and my current self's mind with self-compassionate words so that I could then embrace who I am today because who I am today doesn't have to be who I was yesterday and even tomorrow can be a different even more self-compassionate version of myself than I was even today so we're just always going to be building upon the self-compassion the self-championing learning how to love ourselves in a way that feels authentic, not this, oh, you just gotta love yourself, oh, treat yourself, oh, you know, you're never gonna find love unless you can love yourself first, like what does that even look like? Well, it has to start from a place of being open to letting go of the older version of how we saw ourselves. 
releasing that faulty core belief and embracing the us that we see now in light of that self-compassion, which is that younger version of me was never taught healthy coping strategies. No one ever told me drinking alcohol in excess was bad. They just pretended they didn't even see me or they bought me alcohol. No one told me that if I did those drugs and went out and went to those parties and had all the sex with all of the people that I would feel shitty about myself. Like they just pretended that they didn't even care. Probably because they didn't, <laughs> you know. But finding a way to see ourselves through a lens of compassion is, um, it really does help. And the best way that I found to get there is through journaling. And, um, oh, Harriet, could you pop up our field trip video where we talk about journaling? Um, I think that would be really helpful for you guys, honestly. Um, really need to find that core belief that's faulty, and then we need to replace it with something that's healthy. Um, oh, I know that there was a comment um, on the video from last week or the week before about, well, why don't we just delete the old beliefs? Why do we have to replace them with, with good beliefs? <laughs> um, what happens is if we hold a core belief, which we all do, <laughs> whether it's a faulty one or, or a healthy one, we all hold a core belief. But if we delete that um, and we don't put something healthy in, in the place of the one that was unhealthy, then we will spin. We will spin and we will feel confusion and we will um, create chaos in our own lives. So that's what happens if we don't replace the old faulty core belief with a healthy core belief. I hope this has been helpful, you guys. Oh my goodness, I love this topic. I could do it for five more weeks, but I can't. I want to answer your guys' questions tonight. Monica says, how do you cope with pissing off toxic people <laughs> when you set boundaries with them? <laughs> It is hard for me to really let go of that and not feel like I am being cruel. Ooh, excellent topic, Monica. Well, I have the privilege of knowing a little bit about Monica's story, so I'm speaking from a, a perspective of knowing a little bit about what she's talking about. So when we say setting a boundary with a toxic person, so what we're really saying is that there's a person in our lives that has highly pronounced narcissistic traits or psychopathic traits and possibly only you're the only one who's going to know this they could be on the malignant side of someone like a malignant narcissist or a malignant psychopath what does that even mean Athena malignant sounds like cancer it's what it is so someone with highly pronounced narcissistic traits would be one of those types of people that is very self-important and grandiose and sort of like Psh, yeah you wish you were as good as me but they don't do so at the expense of other people. They don't tackle everybody and abuse everybody just so they can get their needs met, right? But they're just like stuck on themselves. Like that's someone with highly pronounced narcissistic traits. But they're the type of person that if something bad was happening to someone, they'd be like, oh my gosh, can I help? Like, I, oh, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, I'm so sorry. Like, let me, let me help you with that. And so they're not, malignantly self-important and malignantly grandiose and malignantly self-serving because someone who is malignantly toxic, malignantly psychopathic, malignantly narcissistic would not only be self-important or manipulative or sadistic or evil or cruel um, to the point where you're like, wow, that is just really like, who does that? You ask yourself, who does that? That's a red flag that you're dealing with somebody that is like possibly malignant. <laughs> because if you find yourself questioning like, who does that? Who acts that way? Are you kidding me? And there's no sign of empathy or compassion anywhere. And they serve their own needs and serve themselves and think of themselves and do for themselves and get, 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 and, and serve and, and just gobble, gobble, gobble up everything in sight, including people's feelings and, and anything that's good is just completely replaced with what they think all at the expense of other people. They get all of their needs met no matter what happens to other people. That's somebody that's malignantly toxic. So 
if we have the, the context and, and the, the stage is set for what we're talking about, Monica, here over here is a malignantly toxic person who is having all of their needs met, getting their needs met at the expense of other people. They kind of don't have feelings. They're kind of just like a thing that has like programs where you go, boop, boop, boop. They don't really like, oh, I'm so hurt. I can't believe that you wouldn't return my call. Like when they do that and they pretend to emote, like, I can't believe you wouldn't return my call or, I mean, who do you think you are acting that way? Or I was just trying to help. Or you're being so sensitive. That's not what I meant. And they actually act like a human. It's because they're copying someone else that they saw act like that. It's not because they're really feeling it. Because honestly, if a person is toxic and manipulative and psychopathic and narcissistic and they are malignantly so, they will say they're sorry, but nothing will ever change. And they're not really humans. They're kind of just this shell of a weird, odd sort of being that doesn't really feel things. So they will guilt you or try to lure you into feeling compassionate. And they know you're going to feel compassionate. They even can time their watch. Monica, they're going like, oh, yeah, Monica won't return my email. And, she, and she's being really, really rude to me. But wait, like, I'll bet you anything that she'll give in. If, uh, if I just send this one text message and three, two, one, now, I bet you anything she'll, she'll send me another message. And sure enough, we always respond. We always go, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Or we start feeling guilty and go, well, everybody deserves a second chance. Like, I really don't want to be like them, so I'm going to be the bigger person. I'm going to take the high road, and I'm just going to allow them to do this the one, this one time, and maybe they'll change. Maybe it'll be different. So if you are in a situation where someone is repeating toxic behavior over and over and over and over and over again, and anytime you try to establish and maintain a healthy boundary, they guilt you, or they try to lure you, or they try to shame you for having a healthy boundary, just know that that's what they're going to do. And your life will be a lot less crazy and a lot less uncomfortable once you just establish that healthy boundary and say, when you say you're sorry and then you don't change your behavior, I feel really devalued and frustrated. So moving forward, if you choose to act this way again, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm just not. That's not the type of people I want to spend my time with. Or when you insist on inviting Uncle Joey to Thanksgiving, even though you know he sexually abused me when I was eight, I'm not going to show up to Thanksgiving. Sorry. Like, that's my hard line that I'm drawing in the sand. Well, I can't believe you're not going to show up. It's, you're making it so much about you. It's so selfish of you to make it all about you. What about the family? Thanksgiving is a family day. I can't believe that you're making this all about you. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. They're making it about them. The proper response is, oh, my goodness, you're right. If Uncle Joey sexually abused you when you were younger and you're really wanting to have a healthy life, then... I will simply let Uncle Joey know that he's not coming to Thanksgiving. Or perhaps I'll let him know that he should show up around 3 o'clock in the afternoon instead of 11 a.m. And perhaps you could come over at 11 a.m. and enjoy some time with the family. And then Uncle Joey won't come over until around 3. And then everybody's going to be like, where's Joey? Where's Joey? Where's Joey? Oh, Joey's going to be here at 3. And then Uncle Joey shows up at 3. But you're long gone. So this person that is insisting on your abuser being, and this is all just an example, by the way, Everybody, then everybody's happy. But you have to, the only person that's going to establish and maintain a healthy boundary for you is you. Because when we're an adult, it's no one else's job to protect us. No one's coming to rescue us. That's the hard facts. No one is coming to rescue us. No one is coming to help me. My mommy is not going to help me. My daddy doesn't care. 
And my extended family has a lot to deal with on their own, and they're not emotionally available for me. No one's going to rescue me. It's up to me to champion myself and reach my goals. It's up to me to choose to heal. It's up to me to establish and maintain healthy boundaries in my life. It's up to me because no one else is going to do it for me. And that is a hard, bitter pill to swallow. But once we do, then we know the playing field. And we know the steps that need to be taken. And we're not under some fantasy world of, well, maybe they'll come around. Maybe they'll change. Maybe they'll say they're sorry. Maybe they'll apologize for all the wrongs that were done. Maybe they'll, you know, in my 43 years, all those times that I said maybe they will, it hasn't really happened. So I'm only going from, again, my learned experience perspective. And it's really, really, really hard to be the only one that cares about us. But it's kind of where we're at. And it's really, really painful. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I think with it's just time, Monica. With time, you'll feel less cruel because you'll start to feel more mentally strong. And you'll see them for who they really are. Ooh, Monica. Um, there is, on Richard Grannon's website, SpartanLifeCoach.com, there is a book, I believe. It might even be on Amazon, How to Take Revenge on a Narcissist. It's not as weird and woo-woo as it sounds. It's honestly just gets you into the mind of a psychopath so that you, you see how it is that they see the world, the thoughts they think, and you get a look at the control panel. So you're like, wow. I thought they were really feeling feelings, but they really weren't. They were just sort of like pressing buttons and like, it's so weird how they see the world and it's so weird how they think, but I'm glad that I know now. So look that up, Monica, How to Take Revenge on a Narcissist by Richard Grannon and Layla Lorick. And it's either on Amazon or it's on Richard Grannon's website, SpartanLifeCoach.com, or you might even be able to go to NAVS Recovery, Narcissistic of Narcissistic Abuse Victim Syndrome Recovery, N-A-V-S Recovery.com. That's Layla Lorick's website. And um, that book is very, very, very helpful for helping you to see, oh, I shouldn't feel guilty because they don't ever feel guilty. And it's, it's based on science. I mean, it's based on research. There's research that's done. So I hope that's helpful, you guys. These are, these are really, really tough questions, but like, it's big stuff, and these are these are big topics we're covering. So, Rach says, and I want to thank Rach, by the way, you guys. Um, will somebody tag her and just tell her I love her, and I'm so grateful that she asked her question because I know I didn't get to it, and I didn't intentionally skip it at all. This is this is from last week, uh, seven days and an hour and twelve minutes ago. <laughs> uh, Rach says. I have been working on core beliefs since long before I even remembered or acknowledged my abuse, and it seems like every time I think I've got a handle on them, like self-love and self-image, I end up falling back into the depths of self-disgust. Self-disgust. I thought affirmations were working for a while, and then years later I thought living in the present was working. But alas, no. So how do you make it long-term and or permanent? Each time I go back to self-hate and I feel more like a failure. Oh, I love this question. Rach, thank you for your patience and allowing me um, the opportunity to, to share this question of yours with everybody and to answer it. So the answer is there is neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, um, there's also some different types of hypnosis, which I'm not a fan of and I'm not well versed in, but there's also EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, in which your brain actually gets new neuronal pathways and the neurotransmitters and the chemical makeup of your brain actually changes because what happens is, let's say you have a road, okay? You said you always end up back at self-hate or self-disgust. So here you are, affirmations are working, being fully present is working, all these things are working, right? They're working. You're like, woo, go me. And then something happens, boom, and you're triggered. And then you end up taking the road to self-disgust, or you take the road to self-hate, 
Well, in EMDR, what happens is it's kind of, EMDR is very similar to exposure therapy in only one way. And that is during prolonged exposure therapy, you process and process and process and process and process a painful moment, a memory, a traumatic event, until it no longer affects you because you have exposed yourself to it so many times that it's almost like it doesn't have any effect on you ever again. I don't recommend prolonged exposure therapy for trauma survivors, period. I just don't. It's not smart. However, EMDR is if you if you're with a trauma informed practitioner and someone who is specializes in EMDR make sure they're trained in EMDR and they have like a certification of some sort okay but what happens is um, you have all your preliminary stuff that happens with EMDR and then you set up your safe place and and there's um, there is you're within the range of tolerance there's a range of tolerance that you go through I feel like I should record another video on EMDR but we're moving into another series next week. So, but you guys need to understand the range of tolerance and, um, or if you're um, at hyper arousal, um, scratch that, I'll record a different video. I'm not trying to confuse you all. I don't wanna say all these terms and have you be like, she's all over the place, I can't learn from her. So, Rach, you're there, you're with your EMDR practitioner, okay? And then you have your safe place, you've created rapport, and you, your, your therapist, your EMDR person is going to know your range of tolerance, okay? They're gonna get to know you, they're gonna have developed a safe space with you so that you feel that you can be vulnerable with, with them. And in that vulnerability, which I highly encourage, if we're not ready to be vulnerable and, and just risk it, we'll never truly heal, right? So I always encourage my clients to be vulnerable and I'm very sincere with them and they know how grateful I am and, and that I consider it a safe space and um, and, and it really, EMDR and, and vulnerability, in, it, it inspires wholeness and that's what we're going for. We're looking for integration, we're looking to feel whole. So if you're there with EMD, your EMDR practitioner, Rach, and you have these moments that are triggers that you've identified that always take you down the road of self-disgust or self-hate, then when you get there to that place, if you're able to sit with it with your practitioner during EMDR, what happens is you reprocess that memory through eye movement, either with the lights or with the paddles, something that is um, bilateral movement, bilateral stimulation, I believe, Rach, if you have made it all the way through where well, you're like, gosh, affirmations are working and then they're not. And then and then um, being fully present and mindfulness, DBT, is working, but then it's not. And then I'm like, I'm such a failure because I can't get it to stick. Then I believe that as long as you're not prone to long bouts of dissociation where you lose time and you wake up places and, and if you're not living with DD, DID or DDNOS, then EMDR might be perfect for you because you're going to have a desired outcome. You're going to be able to reprocess that memory. And just when you would normally go down the road of self-disgust or self-hate, guess what? EMDR made a brand new road for you and there's grass that's grown over those old roads. You're never going to go down those roads again it's likely that you'll never go down those roads again. For me, I had an entirely new wave of recovery that I started after 10 years ago EMDR. I had some new things come up and my old roads were opened back up again and so I'm back at doing EMDR again and I'm reprocessing again through eye movement des desensitization and reprocessing through EMDR. And so I'm making new neuronal pathways and grass is growing over the old roads again and I hope that this answer has been helpful for you because I'm a huge fan of EMDR. It's really, really, really helpful. So let's see. Excellent questions, you guys. Wow. So Lulu says, I wanted to know how I could stop worrying about what people in my family are saying about me. I hope that's not a silly question. No, it's not a silly question. And honestly, Lulu, it's very, very simple answer. It's not a silly question. It's an excellent question that a lot of people have and they just don't ask. But the answer is, it's just, you're just going to have to try it. You're just going to have to choose in your mind and in yourself and even through journaling and 
you might have to write this out several different times and maybe post it in several different areas in your wallet or in your car or in your bathroom mirror or at work on your computer. But you're going to need to make a choice. And it's very simple. This is this is only is what's worked for me and what's worked for some of my clients. But this is the choice that I made that made all the difference in the world. My mental and emotional well-being means more to me than their approval. My sanity means more to me than their approval. My life, if you've been suicidal, my life is more important to me than their approval. And you really own that and you make it your own and slowly but surely it becomes the mantra by which you live and it becomes your reality and then you look back one day and you're like oh my goodness my life is so much more full and beautiful and colorful and whole and I'm experiencing peace and joy and satisfaction and healthy relationships because I'm not sacrificing myself on the altar of someone else's approval I am not relinquishing my right to mental health and sanity just so I could get their approval. Because honestly, someone else's approval doesn't really mean anything about you. Your worth and your lovableness and your goodness are not predicated upon someone else's ability to approve of you. Lulu and someone else needed to hear that. Your worth, your value, your lovableness, your goodness, the essence of who you are is not predicated upon someone else's ability to see your worth and someone else's choice to approve of you or not. Your worth isn't decided by someone else who decides to give you their approval or not, period. Your worth is there. Your lovableness is there. Your goodness, your value is there. No one can take it from you. No one. So, really good question. Elizabeth says, I'm wondering why the abusers do not suffer from the abuse they inflicted on us. It seems like we are the only ones suffering and they just go on their merry way. Yes. Oh my goodness, Elizabeth. Do you know that that one question, Elizabeth, what you asked this a week ago, so I don't even know if Elizabeth's here tonight, but someone please tag her, tweet her, email her, send her a carrier pigeon and let her know. Like this one word kept me stuck for 10 years, Elizabeth. I stayed stuck for 10 years wondering why, why are you so mean? Like, why don't you feel bad for doing the things you're doing? Like, how can you not feel bad? Like, I'm, I'm your family. Like, do you not see the pain you've inflicted and how wrong it is? Like, who does that? What kind of mindfuckery is involved that you would think that doing those things is okay? And why are you able to just go live your life all fine and thinking that it's fine? Like, it's so not fine. It's just not. It's not ever going to be fine. Like, here I am. I'm the one suffering. I'm the one that's, like, not mentally well. I'm the one hearing voices. And I'm the one that's in therapy. And I'm the one that, like, can't leave my house. And I'm the one who's struggling and gaining weight and, like, blah. You know, like, I mean, it was just my life was falling apart and not theirs. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So for 10 years, I was stuck, Elizabeth, on that one question. Um, but the answer, after all that, the end, where's the answer, Athena? Thanks a lot. So the answer is because they're not really human. <laughs> they um, are missing a key component in their lives and in their makeup. Um, something happened to them probably at a very young age and they just chose to go to the dark side, if you will. Um, they're lacking empathy. They are malignantly narcissistic or psychopathic or sadistic or sociopathic, depending on how careful and calculated they are. Um, they're, they don't feel feelings the same way you feel feelings. You feel things deeply, I bet. 
Elizabeth, I don't know you, so I don't can't say these things for sure, but I'm just going to go out on a limb, <laughs> and I'm going to say you feel things deeply, Elizabeth. You feel things. You see animals or people or something, and you just want to help, and you you can sense things, and you you are intuitive and compassionate and empathetic, and you and you are a feeling person. These people can pretend to be those things, but they're just not those things. They're just not, period. So, yeah, that's why. They can do those things because they just don't have the same feelings that we do. They have buttons and programs and like sort of like they mirror other people's emotions. Like they see people acting certain ways and they like try to do their version of it. It's kind of creepy actually. Um, but they're missing empathy. They lack empathy and there's no way that you can love them enough that they will really begin to have feelings. So please don't get caught up in that hole. If they just knew how much I loved them, then maybe they would change. That kept me stuck for another 20 years. I mean, another 10 years. So now we've talked about me being stuck for 20 years of my life. There, there's some, there's some truth, there's some vulnerability. So don't get stuck up in that thing that I got stuck in, good Lord. John Harvey says, how do you know when you are self-sabotaging yourself and not seeing the truth in front of you? Good question, John Harvey. Well, you know because it's not producing the results you want in your life. Um, Self-sabotaging behaviors are like procrastination, um, perfectionism. Um, they're counterproductive, right? When we procrastinate, we, late, we wait till the last minute. Um, that's a maladaptive coping strategy. When we're perfectionistic and we have perfection paralysis and we're trying to make everything perfect, perfect is a unicorn. It doesn't exist. So things that don't give us the results that we're looking for, we know that we're, those are self-sabotaging behaviors. Excellent question, though. Um, I'm going to stay on topic tonight, guys. And anything that was off topic, I'll try to answer in a DM or in a separate video or something. Trina says, how are we supposed to grieve the giant gaps in what we remember and the horrific stuff we do remember? Ooh, such a good question. Um, I remember saying to my therapist, well, I don't have the memories. Like, I don't, I don't remember it. Like, it's not linear. I can't pull out a timeline and go, this is when this happened, and then this, and this, and this, and this, and it's not correlated. And so how am I ever going to heal? Am I ever going to heal? I can't remember everything. And Sonia said this to me, and I will never forget it, and it's helped me with my clients even. It's not only helped me in my own journey, but it's helped me with probably about eight different clients at this point, and that is... If it hurts, it's real. And if it's real, you can heal. She gave me the first one, if it hurts, it's real, and I added the second part. If, it's, if it hurts, it's real, and if it's real, you can heal. In other words, you might not remember it, but if it hurts and it's like a, you can just feel it and you can ache it and it's confusing and you just are spinning and you're like, I can't find it, I can't find it, and I don't remember it, and I do remember this and it's so excruciating, then those, that pain is real. And so what we need to do is we need to release ourselves from the uncontrollable urge to solve the puzzle, solve the puzzle, solve the puzzle. We need to just go, you know what? I didn't do this to myself. This isn't my fault. And I was not in control of that. What I am in control of is my own mental and emotional well-being today. And I'm choosing to release the need to change the past because I won't ever be able to change the past. I can only move forward from this day forward. And ever since I sort of looked at it that way, I've been able to really heal and get better because I focus on what it is that I can control and what it is that I can help myself with, which is this hurts. I'm going to bandage up this wound that I have, this hurt that I have, and I'm going to sit with it and I'm not going to judge my feelings if I'm feeling angry or hateful or afraid or sad or like I just need to weep or if I'm feeling happy or I'm like wishing horrible things on other people like I'm just sort of sitting with those things and I'm like sitting with it and looking at it and going wow I have a lot going on here and I just accept it for what it is and then I ask myself what choices I can make today what healthy boundaries can I have what safe relationships can I cultivate and nurture how can I take care of myself and be kind to myself today? Because Lord knows no one else is going to be kind to me or heal me for me. I'm the only one that can heal. I'm the only one that cares deeply about myself 
and I need to do those things because my children need my best. My husband or my spouse, my wife needs my best. My boss deserves my best. My community deserves my best. I need to take care of me and put my own oxygen mask on before I go to try to help somebody else because I deserve it and because my loved ones deserve the very best of me. So I hope that helps, Trina. Um, it really helped me when I looked at it that way. Hunter says, excellent question by the way, Trina. Hunter says, how can I fight the belief that since I am tainted, everything I create is wrong? This false core belief is poisoning my creative endeavors and with perfectionism. This false core belief is positioning my, is poisoning. This false core belief is poisoning my creative endeavors with perfectionism. Hunter, the very reality that you are even speaking these words into into existence right now that I want to fight the belief that since I am I am tainted everything I create is wrong so we know that the faulty belief that you have is that I am tainted I am tainted everything I create is wrong that's a false core belief and then you even name it as a false core belief this false core belief is poisoning my creative endeavors with perfectionism. And we know that perfectionism is a self-sabotaging technique. And so what I would do, um, Hunter, is I would sit with that and I would replace that core belief of everything I create is wrong to finding evidence to disprove your hypothesis. What are some things that you've done right? What are some games that you've played that you've leveled up in? What are some... Um, what are some pieces of artwork that you've created that that people have shared with you that they liked it or that you love the way that it turned out? What are some good things that you've done that disprove your hypothesis that everything you create is wrong? And then perhaps journal about that, like write about that. I once believed that everything I created is wrong, but I know that that is a false core belief. The truth is, I have created a lot of things that are not wrong. Here are a few examples. And list all the, the artwork that you've done that people have liked, the things that you've enjoyed, the relationships you've touched, the, the words that you've spoken, the, the games you've played, the, the interactions you've had out in your community, the, the, um, the interactions that you and I even have online and, and you know, the different, like we both, we both love listening to, to Ravi. Um, um, there's just there's relationships that you've cultivated even within our groups and just here online that are that are meaningful and that are healthy and you're doing good in the world and so if we can disprove that hypothesis which is everything I create is wrong then that will definitely help great question hunter Desi says I'm going to therapy and doing several different treatments to help with my fibromyalgia pain how do I communicate that I'm handling all angles, but the doctor looks like he doesn't believe me? And thus my lack of progress, pain-wise, is my own darn fault. Um, I would, that's a great question, Desi, and I think it leads me to ask, is your doctor trauma-informed? And I would perhaps even ask your doctor, what experience do you have with trauma survivors, specifically complex trauma survivors? Um, and if he's not sure about that, there is, um, there's, go to ACEs Too High, Google the words ACEs Too High, and take your ACEs score and then print it out and then bring it to your doctor and let him know. These are some things that I experienced during my childhood that are directly linked to my physical pain and my physical um, health or lack thereof, and it's, clinically proven and proven through research and this is through Harvard Medical and all of these different doctors and um, there's also a really great book as well Desi you may have already read it it's by Bessel uh, Dr. Bessel Vandal Vanderkolk and it's called Body Keeps the Score um, I'm hoping that your doctor understands that complex trauma and any type of trauma we endure during childhood is directly connected with our physical health in adulthood. So um, I would start with a question so he doesn't feel like you're like 
disregarding him or thinking because doctors can be kind of full of themselves and get like wounded egos so perhaps start with a question of like you know are you trauma informed how you know what experience do you have like not even precluding him from even ha not having trauma experience what experience do you have with with trauma opening question and then maybe educating him gently or whatever about um, ACEs the adverse childhood experiences study that has been done and it's um, it's it's widely um, accepted in fact oh my gosh you guys I was so excited to tell you this I can't wait to tell you this the school systems here in the state where I live have accepted and adopted the belief that ACEs exist and they will affect children throughout their adult life and so they are under mandatory reporting now and they are going through continuing education all the teachers are going through continuing education learning about adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma oh, so I was like so excited to hear that um, there was a district teacher that we had dinner with and they were um, sharing that with us so I was so excited but um, that's a great place to start though Desi I would think and I'm so sorry that your pain um, is what it is that's really fibromyalgia is so painful and it's already an invisible illness and so people think you look fine and um, I would just gently try to educate your doctor about what it is that you're actually dealing with I had to educate my general practitioner um, before actually she retired now but but I had to educate her and it was very triggering that I had to educate her because I could sense that she wasn't believing me and because she was the doctor and I was the patient and I wasn't with her for very long because it was very triggering for me that she wasn't validating my my truth so I'm hoping you find someone that's trauma-informed um, oh Rach your core belief is I am not enough <sighs> I've had that one I had all three actually seriously and um, I've been working on those you know I need to find ways to disprove my hypothesis if I believe I'm not enough or I'm not worthy or I'm not lovable or that I am bad I have to find ways to disprove my hypothesis so Rach what I would do with that particular core belief I would find ways I would write it out you know I have a faulty core belief I know that it's a faulty core belief and that it's not true. The belief I, I have held for so long or that I used to hold is that I am not enough. But what I know now is that I am enough. And the following are ways in which I have shown up in the world or lives that I have touched or relationships that I've had over the years um, where I showed up and I did feel like I was enough. Like try to find just one time that you felt like you were enough. And it might be really hard to find it first. Um, so I'll start, <laughs> um, if it's okay. Um, I didn't feel, I mean, let me take the, the notes down for just a second. I have a couple more questions, you guys. I'm gonna run a little long today, but I wanna get them. So, but I wanna look at you guys when I say this. Okay. The core belief that I held if someone could please tag Rach because I want her to see this for sure whatever time this is like tell her to fast forward to one hour and 34 minutes or something so that she can see this um, so I held the core belief that I wasn't enough okay guys um, I have held the core belief that I'm not enough for most of my life it plagued me and it was one of the last ones to leave it falls under that category of I am bad because if I was good, I would be enough. <laughs> but it kept showing up as I'm not enough. I am not fill in the blank enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not skinny enough. If I wasn't pretty enough, it meant that I needed to change something about my appearance. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do, you know, I'll cut my hair. I'll dye my hair. I'll, I'll wear different clothing. That way I'll be pretty enough. Um, I'm not skinny enough. Oop, enter eating disorder and body dysmorphia for me. Um, I am not smart enough. You know, you know how the, the I'm not smart enough showed up? The, the I'm not smart enough showed up in even here, a trauma recovery university. What is a real university? A real university, real university, is a place where smart people go to get degrees, things they hang on the wall. They go through all the, the different studies and they earn 
an AA, an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, a doctorate, multiple doctorates, mul multiple master's degree. They go to grad school, they get an MBA, whatever it is, right? Well, guess what? I was pregnant at age 18, got married, had my son, and then at 19 years old, my husband's dad was like, do over, and he was gone. So here I was, single mom, not college educated, divorced, without a clue, and without a leg to stand on. I didn't know what to do. 19 years old. 19. And so, no college degree, and that was age 19, and here I am, 43, and I'm just being really real and honest with you guys. I felt like I was good enough and smart enough to be here with you guys recording these videos because I had Bobby with me and Bobby had a master's degree, right? Master's level therapist, right? So as long as I was, you know, uh, associated with Bobby, Athena and Bobby, right? Trauma Recovery University, I was smart enough. I was enough to be here serving this community. Right? But Bobby's not here. Bobby's on sabbatical. Bobby's, Bobby has started in very successful international coaching certification program with a waiting list to train up leaders in our community so that we will have trauma-informed coaches and practitioners to help all of you. Well, I didn't found an international coaching certification organization. I don't have a master's degree. I don't even have an undergrad, a bachelor's degree. So how am I even enough to be here recording these videos with you, right? Do you hear all of the limiting beliefs? Do you hear all of the shame oozing out of me, out of all orifices? Do you, do you hear it? Do you feel it? Is it icky? Is it all over you right now? So I decided over the past few weeks and more specifically over the past few days to just take off all of my masks and throw caution to the wind. And I'm like, you know what? No, I am enough. I am enough. I've been told that I am enough by enough of you that you don't care if I have an MBA or a PhD. You are being helped by these videos. These videos are making a difference in your life. I am making a difference in someone's life today by deciding to show up even though I'm not educated and I'm not smart enough or pretty enough or skinny enough. I'm not enough. So as a huge act of self-championing and self-compassion and self-love, I started my own YouTube channel. I just posted in the groups, I'm going to start my own YouTube channel for daily support for survivors and vlogs. If that interests you, click the subscribe button. Talk about vulnerable. Little Miss, I encourage vulnerability. I'm sincere and grateful to be here with you and I want to inspire you towards wholeness and a whole life where you experience peace and joy and healthy relationships. Like, like I had to really take off all my masks and throw away all my excuses and be like, here I am, open to rejection. So please don't subscribe out of pity is what I'm saying. <laughs> Only subscribe to that channel if you really want daily support from me. An uneducated, not pretty enough, not skinny enough, not enough girl. That's the only people I want subscribing to that channel. And if you want to find that channel, it's somewhere. Um, it's on YouTube. All you do is, I don't even have a fancy name for my channel because I don't have enough subscribers and my channel's not old enough to have a name. It just says in lowercase letters, mostly Athena. So, Go up to the little hourglass and type in lowercase letters, mostly Athena. 
and there you will find me, my uneducated, unskinny, not enough self. And I will be here, vulnerably, showing up to support people every single flippin' day in whatever way I can, because I'm enough. And that's terrifying for me to even say out loud. <laughs> so um, that's a deep one. That's a hard one. And I live with that one. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to continue to work on that one. Because that one's probably going to take a long time to be completely restructured. But the way I'm challenging that old core belief that I'm not enough is by trying to disprove my hypothesis and by taking inspired action and by changing my daily habits. So if I show up daily disproving my hypothesis, which is that I'm not enough, and I'm showing up daily supporting people, and for the most part I'm making a difference and I'm helping people, then I'll no longer hold that core belief that I'm not enough. So I hope that helps you guys. Um, I got a couple more questions, and I'm so excited to finish them up. This is like a two-hour special. This is a wrap-up for our for our series, we might what we might need to do next time, guys, is we'll go four. We'll go four weeks on a series, like part one, part two, part three, part four. Because I don't want to not answer your guys' questions. You know what I mean? Like, I want to answer them all. Um, Poppy says, how would you shift a core belief that you are able to acknowledge and see the limitations belong to parts of you that you like and conflict with feelings of certain certainty and safety. So what I think you're asking, Poppy, is that you're acknowledging that there are parts of you, like younger versions of you, that need one of these core beliefs. Like, I have younger versions of myself that truly do believe that I am not enough. And I have all the evidence to back it up by every message that was ever given to me by all my abusers. So, like, I think what you're saying is you want to shift a core belief that your adult self knows is limiting you, but there are parts of you that still need that core belief. And if that is the question you're asking, Poppy, I would, first of all, I would make sure that I have a trauma-informed practitioner. I wouldn't just try to do this on my own because there needs to be titration. There needs to be um, moderation. There needs to be balance. There needs to be care and self-care all like happening in order for this to happen but I would allow my adult self to sit with my younger versions of me and I would make sure that they knew that I was listening to them and that I would make sure that I told them and had my therapist my person that's doing EMDR or CBT or DBT or whatever modality that we're doing I would make sure that from multiple angles, my littles, my, my younger versions of me, knew that we believe them and we validate their truth. It's absolutely true that you need to hold on to that belief. It's absolutely true. I believe you that you feel that you're not enough or I believe you that you feel like you're bad and it's okay. I'm, I'll just sit with you in that. I'll sit with you while you feel bad. I'll sit with you even if you feel unlovable, it's okay. It's all right. We're going to get through this together. It's okay if you feel unsafe. It's okay if you feel unlovable or if you feel bad or if you feel like you're not enough or you feel like you are not worthy. I'll sit with you during that and and make sure that you have your therapist or your, your practitioner also really witnessing that, right? Because it needs to come from more than one angle. Because our younger versions of us don't trust us yet completely. We're not the safe person for them that they need us to be yet. Which is why a trauma-informed practitioner can be that safe person. That just a little bit of extra accountability. Just a little bit of extra like, oh, well, if she thinks that we're safe, then, and she thinks that we're then maybe, okay. But it's true. The way I'm feeling is true. And then if we're able to sit with those younger versions of us, and it's okay that you feel that that's true. I'll sit with you in this. It's okay. I can see how that was definitely true for you. 
I'm never going to tell you that your truth is not true. Your, the truth that you live through will always be true for you. It's okay. I'll just sit with you in that. We can't change our younger version of ourselves' minds or invalidate their truth, right? I once had a client that had a younger, younger, younger version of them that needed certain things and was scared, but an older version of them hated that younger version and just wanted them dead and gone. So it's important to love and sit with that younger version that feels unsafe. And it's also important to sit with those older versions that might be sassy little teenagers and go, I can see how you would feel that way. Like, let's just sit, let's just sit this out. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's just sit with that. Let's not hurt anybody. Like, I can see how you would feel that way. But, you know, let's just, let's just not jump to any conclusions. Let's just sit with that. Like, especially if some of your parts are in direct conflict with one another and they feel afraid of one another or angry with one another, it's important that we validate everybody. And the way that that needs to happen usually best if it's in person. And if you're working with a virtual practitioner and you're headed towards that direction where you have parts that are in conflict with one another, it might be good to pause and to just sit with every version of yourself and wait until you can have an in-person session, few sessions with someone in person that can sort of sit with and validate every part that you have. So. I hope that I'm on point, Poppy. If you could let me know, that'd be great because I just I want to make sure. So, Joey says, my mother told me that I'm damaged goods and that I am never going to have my dream job of being a kindergarten teacher because the kids would be scared of me. I believed it and I still do and now I'm too afraid to go after my dream job. Were you afraid to go after your dream job after everyone told you that you would fail and that you were damaged goods? Yes. I was definitely afraid, Joey. I was I was told all the same things, and also I was told, oh my goodness, I remember my son's dad telling me over and over and over again, you are so used up, you are so disgusting, no one's ever going to love you, no one's ever going to want you, because look at you, you're a teenager, and you have the body of like a 30-year-old, and there are people that are your age that are super hot and super gorgeous, and no one's ever going to want you, because look at you, you're used up, you're gross. I remember him telling me that, and I remember believing it, like thinking that I was used up and gross and disgusting because I was like, oh, like what he's saying is totally true. There are people my age that are super hot, and I'm not super hot anymore because my hair is in a bun, and I'm breastfeeding a baby, and my clothes don't fit. So everything, since those little bits of what he said are true, everything must be true. <laughs> and so when your mother says, you're this and you're this and you're that and you're that and that's never going to happen. It's it's very sinister and it's very evil because you can pick out parts of what she says that might seem true to someone and then so then we just sort of lump it all and go, well, if that's true, then all of it must be true. And then we sort of own that baggage and that those unhealthy um, views and things. And I'm here to tell you, Joey, that I'm not afraid of you. And if you were a kindergarten teacher, and I, I've gotten to know you a little bit, and you're very compassionate, and you're kind, and I would assume that if you were to be educated and become a kindergarten teacher, it's because you have a heart for children, and that you want to help shape their minds and help them know that, that they can be anything they want to be when they grow up, and you would want them to dream big and chase after their goals, and and I think it, you would make a fantastic teacher. I think that it would be amazing for young children to have a teacher who believed in them and wanted to cheer them on. But in order for us to become the healthiest version of us, we have to establish and maintain healthy boundaries with toxic people and only surround ourselves with people who believe in us. And sadly, Joey, you're in a situation right now where you're stuck and you're in close proximity to your mom who doesn't believe in you. And so it continues to poison your mind. So unfortunately, you're in a situation where you will likely fall back into self-hatred or limiting beliefs because those negative beliefs are reinforced over and over again by being in close proximity to your, your mom. But 
if you were to be removed from the physical presence and the virtual presence, like telephone, texting, computer, anything of your mother, for let's say even like 30 to 60 days, your life would feel so much more colorful. You would see colors in deeper shades and hues, and you would hear things differently. You would notice things about yourself that you liked, and you would notice that your mental health would improve, and that your relationships with people online and in person would also improve because you don't have constant like toxic green ooze. Like I always refer to like Scooby Doo, like when they were around those ghosts and stuff. There was that oozy toxic green fluorescent yellowish green ooze that would float in the room. Like when we're around toxic people. We don't even know it, but they have this toxic green ooze coming off of them and it like gets on us and we start breathing it in and we allow ourselves to ingest their, their limiting beliefs and their thoughts and their lies and we just take them in and we own them as ourselves. Like we gobble them up like Pac-Man and that's just not healthy. So I would, the first thing I would do, Joey, is I recommend that you limit your um, connection with your mother because she's not ever going to change. Your mom's not ever going to change. She's been toxic from the time you were young. She allowed you to be abused, and she's still continuing to abuse you in adulthood, verbally and emotionally, and possibly otherwise. I don't know. But she has shown you her true colors, and her true colors will not change. So your mom is not going to change. So if you desire a different outcome in your life, the only thing that's going to change is you you're the one that's gonna to need to make the change. I realize that there are physical limitations and you're not able to get up and just leave because you have physical limitations. And all I can say is, A, I think you would be an amazing teacher. B, I'm not scared of you and I don't know anybody who would be scared of you because we've all gotten to know you. And C, perhaps limit your contact with your mother as much as possible. Um, perhaps building up to a, a point in which you're no longer in contact with her. Because the last thing I want for you, for you, Joey, is for your mom to poison you and to get in the way of your success and living your dream the way I did. I allowed my mom to limit my success and the view I had of myself and corrode every area of my life until I was 40. And I, that's the last thing I want for you. Like, I'm turning 44 this month. It's been the greatest four years of my entire life. Why? Because I'm not, I don't have toxicity in my ears and in my head and in my body and in my system every single day anymore. Do I feel guilty? Sometimes, but not really, because my mental and emotional well-being means more to me than her approval. And I didn't come to that conclusion overnight. It took me, obviously, 40 years. <laughs> so the stuff I'm teaching you guys and sharing with you is not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. I hope that was helpful, Joey. Rebecca says, core beliefs. My body is bad and shameful. My perceptions are faulty. Okay. My body is bad and shameful is um, another version of I am bad because we are our body and our body is us and we can't separate our body from who we are. So you have two things going on. I am bad or my body is bad and shameful, right? And then you have my perceptions are wrong, which could be true. Because if you perceive your body to be wrong or shameful or bad, your perception could be off. And I held the same belief about myself. Body dysmorphia. Let me take a drink of water, guys. Hold on. I'm like really thirsty. I know why I'm really thirsty, because we're going on two hours. Goodness gracious, you guys. Oh, my gosh. Let me put this down here, because I love, dropped my napkin. Okay. So, 
the way I had to challenge that faulty core belief, which is that my body was bad. I hope that you're still here and that you can hear what I'm about to say because I just got done saying a little bit ago that exposure therapy is not something I would ever, ever, ever recommend for trauma survivors. But I am going to recommend exposure therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, if you're living with body dysmorphia. So, Rebecca, I would love for you to find a way to look at yourself in the mirror for like five minutes a day and move. Like, just be in awe of how your body moves, your arms, your fingers, your wrists, your legs, your ankles, your toes, your neck your shoulders, whatever it is that you have access to. If you are uh, not able-bodied and you are living with physical limitations, find some ways to find the areas of your body that are working, in, in even including the areas of your body that aren't working, and find ways to marvel at how everything in your body works together and everything in your body knows about the other parts in your body. Every day for five minutes, focus on, focus on like something good and something that you can appreciate and move with your body. And look, look in the mirror at your body, even the parts that you don't like. Like I don't like this area of my arms. Like I know that a lot of people talk about that, but like it moves and I know that it's skin and it's supposed to move, but I'm like, I don't like this area of my body. Or, um, or like, I don't like my knees. I've always had this thing with my knees ever since I was a little kid, like seven years old. I'm like, my knees are fat. Like, what seven-year-old has fat knees? Like, no one. So um, I've just had body dysmorphia dating all the way back to when I was very, very, very little. But what's helped me lately is movement, like just moving my body and like looking at my body and the way that it looks when it when I move it. And like, even though it seems like it would be like, Ew! It's not. I actually have, my body dysmorphia has actually lessened with exposure therapy. So I don't recommend prolonged exposure therapy for trauma survivors regarding your traumatic memories from abuse. But if you're living with body dysmorphia, I believe that exposure therapy works. And that might help challenge that core belief. But ultimately, Harriet popped up the, uh, the YouTube card earlier on journaling when we went on the field trip. Journaling out those core beliefs and then disproving our hypothesis totally helps. But the one thing you mentioned about your perceptions being wrong, we can find ways to, to look at the ways that our perceptions have been wrong. But if you're going to do that, I want you to have a separate list right by its side of all the ways that you perceived something and your perception was right on. I perceived that it would be cold outside, so I grabbed a sweater. I perceived that the light was turning red and that, that the person in front of me might not have seen the red light, so I kept a distance between me and the car in front of me when I was driving. All the, the ways in which your perception was right. Or you walked into a restaurant and you had a feeling that the food wasn't gonna be that good. And then you ordered and you're like, I kinda knew that the food wasn't gonna be that good. So your perception was right. And also, Harriet, if you could pop up the video um, for healing our, con healing our intuition through congruence. This is a big one, Rebecca. I'm not sure. I think you've been with us for a while. Um, and by the way, Rebecca, can you DM me if I didn't welcome you into the group that you wanted to be in? I can't remember if I welcomed... I've, I'm so like, I have like blur. I have like dozens and like a hundred people that I'm sort of messaging with and vetting and like welcoming. And like, I've, I've only welcomed in like five lately. And I know I have so many more, but it's because I'm still in the process. So Rebecca, if I haven't welcomed you in, will you please DM me? And then um, watch that video from, I want to say it was like two or three years ago on healing our intuition through congruence. And it's as we show up as our authentic selves or we 
um, follow our gut instinct on certain things and all of a sudden we begin to to heal our intuition and Rebecca I want to if someone could tag Rebecca and make sure she doesn't miss this part because it's important the reason why we struggle with our intuition and our perceptions is because of gaslighting so our reality was challenged or tainted by someone who was either narcissistically abusive or psychopathically abusive or manipulative or they 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 took away our ability to make judgment calls so that we would lean on them for for reality check they would they they disarmed us in such a way that we would need to refer to them and ask them for their version of reality because we didn't trust ourselves anymore and so that's the reason why we have that is because of gaslighting so in case you're wondering where it came from that's always really helpful for me to like remember um, I like to remind myself of that <laughs> uh, let me see heroes don't wear capes last question everybody last question I think my inner child is a genius and my beliefs broken down are unbelievably complex rules they are so clever it is seemingly impossible to find reason find a reason to compromise them what the fuck do I what the fuck do I do <laughs> um, I think my inner child is a genius by the way congratulations amazing compassion compassion applause and love and admiration for the younger versions of us my beliefs broken down are unbelievably complex rules they're so clever and it is seemingly impossible to find reason to compromise them what the fuck do I do this is what you do this is what you do heroes don't wear capes so what you do is if your younger version of yourself is a genius which that that could very well be I wouldn't doubt it it happens right like there are many of us on this channel that were quite brilliant at a very young age and then somehow over time when we started having all these memories we feel like less of a person we feel less human we feel less real we have, a, we have derealization, we have depersonalization, we have dissociation, we have emotional flashbacks, we have anxiety, we have PTSD, we have relationship issues, financial issues, job issues, um, health issues, all this stuff so that we feel less than, less than, less than, less than, we feel horrible. So if your core beliefs are these complex things that your younger version of yourself is rationalizing and saying yep that's true I'm the genius and I'm saying that's true what you're gonna need to do heroes don't wear capes is you're gonna need to sit with that young little genius and you're just gonna need to validate her and tell her how smart she is and how amazing she is and how proud you are of her and then slowly but surely make and, and I would work with your therapist on this a trauma-informed therapist for sure and if you have access to EMDR it wouldn't help I mean it wouldn't hurt sorry EMDR wouldn't hurt like to desensitize those core beliefs and some of the things that are going on there like trying to poke holes in that to desensitize that through eye movement is uh, is something that could really help the bilateral movement the bilateral stimulation really helps with with new core belief restructuring so because you make a whole new road get like a brand new brain right you feel like a whole brand new person so but I would honestly work with a practitioner a trauma-informed practitioner to sit with all of your littles and to find out I mean many times there's more than one and the ones that want to like hate on the genius one are the ones that came up with all of the core beliefs that are limiting beliefs like if you have a younger version of you that's quite brilliant then there are like older versions or even younger that want to find every reason in the whole world to be like okay smarty pants like you can't always be right like if you were so smart and you're such a genius then why did we get abused why did we choose this wrong partner why did we make this mistake why did we get victimized why is this why 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 and then they have all this like like a, they've, they've developed a case against your younger genius and so then your poor little younger genius is like really really smart but doesn't have an answer to all of these like angry questions so you're gonna have to just make sure that you and a practitioner sit with every version of yourself and validate them and hear them out 
and not judge them because over time those core beliefs that are the wrong core beliefs like that you're not enough or you're not smart enough skinny enough good enough whatever enough or that you're bad or that you're unlovable or that you're unsafe or that you are not worthy those are gonna fall by the wayside because through process of elimination once every one of you feels safe there's no reason for all the hypervigilance, which is where a lot of the limiting beliefs come from. So I realize I went over time today, guys, like way over. I'm going to call this a two-hour special is what I'm going to call it. I'm not going to call this a failure to end on time. I'm going to – oh, thanks for subscribing to my channel, you guys. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for subscribing to my brand new YouTube channel. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. Oh, I couldn't do any of this without you, you guys. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited. Thank you, 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 thank you. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to call this a two-hour special. I'm not going to call it a failure to end on time. How's that? Let's talk about a reframe, right? Um, you guys are amazing. I couldn't do any of this without you. So many of you stuck around till the very, very end. Um, thank you. Please be kind to yourself. These videos can be triggering for even hours afterwards. Um, please um, always copy and paste and share on your favorite social network um, the like suicide prevention hotline like crisis text line org rape abuse incest national network please share those types of things as much as you can because you could save somebody's life or help them you know you could be the one person that they they see it in their feed and they're like, oh my goodness, there is help out there. You know what I mean? So, and then always if you are ever um, inspired by or helped by any of the work I'm doing on my channels, then please give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Um, subscribe, click the bell for the little like so you'll know when I go live. And then um, if you ever want to share the content. I know that this is a long video, so maybe it's not shareable, but um, there are going to be a lot of little bite-sized videos that you can share in the future. Because there's, oh, did you see my limiting belief pop up? Did you see it? Did you see it right there? I caught it just now at the very end of the video. My limiting belief says to me, I'm not brief enough. I'm not concise enough. So I just talked you out of sharing this video because I said it wasn't short enough, that it's too long to share. I'm going to sit with that. And I'm going to show up next week. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> so thanks so much, you guys. You guys are amazing. I love you, and I'll see you next week. Bye.